Good morning, everyone. It is now um, 10 o'clock, so I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm just going to do a quick housekeeping thing. All right, let's go ahead and unmute Sean here. Sean, can you hear me? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, awesome. So um, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Before we kick things off, just want to welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you here this morning. We know these are crazy times and we wanted to make sure that um, you know, while we aren't able to access our customers in person for hands-on training that we still offer, you know, training virtually. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, so you are aware, we do have the audio muted for um, everyone just to make sure that we um, kind of keep the line clear where everybody can hear Sean really well. But if you do have questions, we definitely want to encourage that you use the chat feature to ask any questions you might have. So those who aren't familiar with Zoom, if you hover over your screen down at the bottom in the middle, there's a little chat button and you can click that chat button, type a message in the Zoom group chat, and I will be sure to let Sean know when questions arise. So definitely don't be scared to use that feature. Um, also want to let everyone know that in addition to um, our webinar today, we will also be having a webinar in two weeks at this same time on grab sample systems led by Swagelock's Matt Dixon, who is our senior principal design engineer, and Karim Maraz, who is our analytical product manager. So um, if you're looking for some training hours and that sort of thing, we also have a grab sample opportunity in two weeks. And now I am going to just give a brief introduction for Sean. So Sean Hunsaker is our presenter today. He is a chem and refining market manager for Swagelock Company with a focus on supporting rotating equipment customers at OEMs and process plants around the world. Having visited close to 100 process plants in various geographies, he has experience with the challenges faced by engineers tasked with keeping pumps, compressors, and other rotating equipment available for production. He is a 15-year veteran and seeks to enhance the proficiency of the global swage lock network in serving the chemical and refining market through a continuous dialogue with top thought leaders in the industry. And with that, I will hand it over to Sean. Thanks, Ashton. Um, before I get started, I just want to say thanks, everybody, for joining in. And to give you a little bit more insight to my background, um, Ashton spoke to it, but you know, my job is working with our sales and service centers globally, as well as then the customers on, on two facets of rotating equipment at the OEM side. So our customers like Siemens or ITT Goulds, pump manufacturers, compressor manufacturers, as they start to use more tubing um, at sizes approaching inch and a half. Uh, tubing. Uh, they implement that for a variety of reasons on their um, uh, equipment that they build in the shop and a lot of that's to reduce labor costs um, and we see that also being implemented in the field at the maintenance and repair operations of rotating equipment engineers in the departments in our chem plants and refineries. The focus of what I'll be talking about today is SwageLock's offering for rotating equipment as it relates to API 682, uh, specifically the fourth edition of, of that standard. And so um, with that, I, I think I'll get started. If you guys have questions throughout, certainly just um, you know ping them on the chat feature and then we can answer them as we go along. Okay, so. This I took from a common, uh, very popular pump magazine that's published here in the U.S. And you know, I, I'm looking at this is because this is why swage lock distributors have and our and our engineers have become really involved with rotating equipment departments at chem plants and refineries, because about 39% of the time pump failures are caused by mechanical seals, and then they spend you know close to half of their budget on um, those pump repair costs. So, uh, you know, our customers and the engineers in the rotating equipment department approach us because they're looking to do two things. One is, you know, 
work on their reliability issues. Um, for whatever reason, you know, a, a pump failure is a bad thing, and, and certainly, you know, reducing failures related to mechanical seals is important for reliability and keep equipment available, as well as then bringing down that, you know, budget and, and the expenses associated with doing repairs, not just from the cost of the seals themselves, but also writing work orders, having guys out in the field, uh, doing those repairs. So it's a major concern that we see um, throughout the world, really, from rotating equipment departments. And so that's how we've kind of become involved with API 682 and SEAL support systems. So as I go around the world, I share these metrics again from the same pump magazine, uh, looking at you know a couple of metrics. And when we see the mean time between failure being probably the most common metric that uh, pump guys will talk to us about and the rotating equipment engineers will work with their seal manufacturer on tracking these things. So I'm looking at, in the upper right, that table two. Uh, this is really the, the excellent and very good uh, 90 months for mean time between failure for seal, the target seal failure, uh, mean time between failure is, is what we see our, our customers implementing. They're really looking to get um, in excess of that. And quite frankly, I think if you know you look across the a, a big site that could have a thousand or twelve hundred pumps, um, you know, eighty percent of those are going to perform far in excess of that excellent or very good rating. And really, it is a, a smaller portion that brings that mean time between failure. And that's that's kind of where we spend our time. I took a picture when I was at a, a refinery in the uh, state of Kansas, and, uh, and this was their bad actor pump list. And, and so when we work with rotating equipment departments, this is really you know, where we're getting involved with the ones that they're having issues and they wanna make sure that they work through this list and tackle those issues. So I pulled out one line of this spreadsheet, pump P20143. Just to give you an example, they had 12 repairs in the last five years with a total seal cost of about $100,000. Root cause analysis led them to say, hey, we're going to install a Plan 54 circulator. So that, that's how we get involved in building seal support systems when customers have issues and then you know do the root cause analysis. Sometimes we assist with that and then we'll you know work on building the actual API plan for them. All right, so just to give you an overview of what SwageLock is offering, we're going to talk today about specific products to help reduce downtime and improve the um, operation of SEAL plans themselves. The ability for sales and service centers to build panels or entire skid system for whatever piping plan uh, you specify as a customer. In our literature, I've divided out these categories to really mirror uh, Eagle Bergman's classification uh, because there's a lot of terminology that's used in this world. Um, guys will call out specific API plan numbers. Some guys just say flush plans or gas seals. So by saying process side between seal or atmospheric side, um, we really are trying to highlight where in relation to the seal face this system goes. So instead of uh, many different classifications, we broke them up into process side, which is primarily your flush plans, the between seal plans, which are the seal pots or gas seal plans, and then the leakage collection and quench side, uh, which are on the atmospheric side of the seal. This is what I see when I travel around. Um, this particular picture here is from one of the refineries on the East Coast that I believe it was first built and started as a refinery in the late 1800s. So quite old. Um, you can see here this seal plan has half inch schedule 80 pipe, a lot of potential leak points, elbows, flow restrictions, and certainly it's made out of carbon steel. You can see it's quite rusty. And so, you know, the, you know, a lot of plants over the last 20 to 30 years have been working to replace these systems over time. And the one thing that I keep hearing from rotating equipment guys is I got to get away from the piping, specifically threaded piping, because of all these potential leak points and the potential reliability or safety issue that that can cause. By upgrading them from carbon steel to a stainless steel system, you get additional benefits as well. Um, and certainly moving to tubing, you're going to reduce a lot of those um, hard 90s in that system and get improved flow. So our first engagement with API 682 
came uh, in the early 2000s when our sales and service centers uh, worked with rotating equipment departments on providing nitrogen panels for pumps, specifically in the Gulf region. Um, at that time, I'm not sure that we were you know, really sure what all the gas seal technology was about, but, you know, building a nitrogen panel, delivery panel for a seal was well within our capabilities. And then as that standard evolved, um, the second edition of API specified that gas seal. Um, so we started becoming involved with making these panels more often and making sure that we had clean, dry nitrogen delivered at the correct flow rate for these gas seals. So gas seals kind of, you know, with that third edition of API and their popularity starting to come into play in different regions uh, was our first entree into the world of building seal support systems. And this is kind of what we saw out in the field um, from the manufacturers of seal systems when they designed a nitrogen panel or somebody uh, at the plant would make one. It was a extremely basic design, not much consideration given to the quality of the individual components. Um, you can see here that some of these um, uh, flow meters on here are, are acrylic. They can tend to fade over time. Um, so reliability and maintenance of the panel wasn't really given a ton of consideration. And through talking with groups at the rotating equipment departments, they really felt that there's an opportunity to improve upon this because a lot, they lost a lot of seals based on commissioning, improper commissioning of a pump. Somebody would not turn the nitrogen on uh, to the seal before they commissioned the pump, um, whether it's a flush plan like a 32 or a gas seal, they had these issues. So they you know, really wanted to say, how can we improve even these simple gas panels to make it more user friendly and more reliable? So if we flash forward today, on the left, what we have there are 72s and 74s as an original design. So we start with a standard design per API best practices. And then uh, we'll work with you locally. And you can see on the right, it's a little different. The inlet and the outlet are now on the bottom instead of uh, on opposite sides of the panels. But that's fine. That's OK. We can work with that. Those are easy changes for us to make locally at all of our sales and service centers. So it's, it's very simple to manufacture these panels. And if you look at the panel on your right there, uh, about 80% of those components are swage lock components anyway. So it's very similar to the gas panels we build for all types of customers. And then here from our catalog, you can see the 72 and 74. All right, so we start with this and then just edit from there, whatever you want, whatever particular options you want. Um, for instance, on the left right there, you can see that's a single stream dual outlet 72. Well, that could be one panel for a um, between bearing pump where you're gonna have two seals on that pump. Um, the conversation then we would like to have is, well, is that a reliability concern for you to have a single panel running two seals? Um, so there are considerations in the designs of these that uh, all of our sales and service centers and our engineers uh, understand and then work with our customers on to make sure that we combine the right functionality, reliability, and design to support your goals at the plant. You know, for instance, sometimes customers will say, hey, you know, my, my nitrogen's clean, it's dry, don't worry. Um, really, best practices are putting those coalescing filters in because no matter how clean and dry you think your nitrogen is, uh, once it gets to the seal, even small amounts of contamination, whether it's liquid or particulate, can affect the health of that seal. Our involvement with liquid systems and the flush plans, the seal pod systems um, became increasingly important with the addition, uh, the fourth edition in May of 2014, where they corrected some tables in the front and really gave rotating equipment departments uh, a clear option uh, saying that, you know, piping or tubing can be used, it's your preference in there. And they listed tables to use up to one inch tubing. They also said that Transmitters are preferred over pressure switches. So in general, um, these systems started looking more like control panels and less like pipe systems, especially then recommending that all instruments, even gauges have a block and bleed so that you can replace instruments without taking the entire panel or even the pump off of line. So all the things that we've been building for years and years for customers, these systems, seal support systems began looking, having more instrumentation and features that mimicked work that we were already doing.
Finally, SEAL manufactures themselves, the Flow Serves, the John Cranes and Eagle Bergmans. They're good customers of ours around the world. They were using more tubing in the systems uh, generally, so they would leave the shop instead of having welded pipe or threaded pipe, they now had tubing. Uh, for all the reasons that customers like using it, faster to build, easy to handle, things like that. Um, so it, it was also introduced, introduced, tubing was introduced from the OEM world as well. So just to give you an overview of all the different offerings. So in the standard swage lock application guide for seal support systems, like I said, we're dividing them out between process, between seal and atmospheric. Uh, we're gonna list out a standard design per API requirements for each plan. Now, starting with something like a plan 11, that's really just a couple of fittings and an orifice, right? So that can be ordered as a kit of components to be installed. We'll still do a, an engineer drawing if that's what you require, um, but it can just be a kit of components and then installed on the site. If you look at the plan 32, that would be developed and, and delivered as an entire panel. Moving to the between seal systems, Again, a standard design started there, so you can order the entire unit that includes the seal pot, the stand, whatever instrumentation you specify. Moving into something more complicated like a 54 or 55 where it's a skid system that's also being able to be built at our distributors or tech centers globally. And lastly, then you have some of the leakage collection and gas handling plants um, down at the bottom there, which are also located on a panel. The final group is just the atmospheric side plans, and those are pretty basic, um, but again, starting with API standard and then modifying or changing as needed per your site requirements. One thing I did want to point out, because in my interactions with these groups around the world, um, I've seen instances where a tubing specification from uh, the instrument group might be copied over to the rotating equipment group without thought. API really recommends um, a heavier minimum wall thickness than will ever be needed for these applications. Typically, if I would design a half inch system in many applications, I would use 049 wall tubing. API recommends half inch 065 wall tubing. And it really is not to uh, over any concern about the pressure containing capabilities of tubing. Um, your burst pressure for 065 tubing is going to be, you know, far, far north of, of anything that you'll see in a chem plant or a refinery. They do it because of um, the external robustness. They know that guys around these equipments are used to working with piping generally. So they wanna make sure that, you know, if somebody bumps into it, steps on it, grabs it as a handle, even though that's not recommended and not suggested, they know it could happen and they wanna use that heavier wall for rigidity and robustness of the system. So just make sure rotating equipment groups, if they're out there, they're pulling the right tubing, installing the right tubing on these systems. And so tubing on flush systems, this is kind of what we see out there. A very common instance is to have that piece of four or six inch threaded pipe, uh, carbon steel maybe, uh, going into maybe one or two fittings and then transitioning from tubing to there and tying into either the suction or discharge side of the system. So one of the things that rotating equipment groups asked us to do was help them solve the problem of a potential leak point at that first fitting. They also said, hey, it's, you know, carbon steel, we're, we're using that. Um, our specification really calls for stainless steel, so we'd like to use stainless steel. And then lastly, there have been issues with, you know, you're buying inexpensive pipe fittings. Some of these come from various places in the world where the quality of those threads is not so great. So there was some cross-threading issues or um, damage to those female ports on that seal itself. So we're looking to solve a variety of problems with a simple product and we developed the extended male connector. This is a standard four or six inch long swage lock fitting. It's just, we made a swage lock fitting a lot longer. And so you have a big heavy hex on there for a guy to get a good wrench on and get a good installation on that seal chamber. This gets you out and away from the shroud of the pump and it only gives you one potential leak point there at that swage lock fitting. 
These are commonly stocked in half inch, three quarter inch sizes where you can adapt from a half inch port to three quarter inch tubing if you'd like. So this is available. For really tight areas, on the left here, I'm showing a Sundyne port, uh, pump where you can see those ports for the flush plans are, are recessed in the, the body housing of that pump. And then on the right, that picture you can see, you know, somebody had a nipple in there, then they installed a hex coupling and then a male uh, swage lock fitting. So they've introduced, you know, to get in that tight spot, a couple of extra fittings, which is certainly something we want to get away from. Uh, so we developed the machine shank extended male connector. And basically all we've done is taking that um, hex that went the length of the fitting and machined it back so you can fit these into recessed ports. And I would say if I was a, a site, um, this was probably would be the, the, the one fitting that I would stock because it's applicable to all installations, uh, especially even those that are have those 45 degree recessed ports on the seal uh, or tight clearance areas to get into that seal chamber. So even in new installations, we get involved, uh, you know, this plant here is, I think at the time I visited, it was maybe just a little over than a year old. It is a gas processing plant down on the fracking fields of, of Southeast Ohio. And, uh, we, you know, I noticed a common thing, uh, a couple of things here that, that were issues. Um, so modifications were made right after installation and here's some of the issues that they had. One was with the orifice plate right there on their simple flush plan, plan 11, uh, was that that piece of welded pipe, when they had some clogging issues on that orifice, there was no way for them to even see if that orifice was clogging. They would have to really rely on the operation of the pump, and if they had issues with the pump, they would find, oh yeah, we had a clogging orifice. I'm also looking here down at this connection into the seal chamber itself. I've got one, two, three, maybe four fittings there. So we have four potential leak points because we find that when um, you know technicians are tasked or mechanics are tasked with going out there, if there isn't a plan in place, a drawing done, they're just gonna grab whatever's in their, um, their cart uh, for fittings and cobble something together to make it work. Maybe not even understanding that every time I add an extra fitting, I'm adding a potential reliability issue and a leak point. And certainly the worst thing on this picture, something you guys probably have already seen, is the use of hoses running to and from the seal pot. Now for ANSI installations in, in you know, non uh, VOC service, hoses will probably be acceptable, but in a hydrocarbon plant, this is a gas plant, um, they're dealing with you know the butanes, the methanes, they definitely don't wanna be having hoses in here because I can't tell you when that hose is gonna fail, I just know that it will. Uh, it will fail at this crimping part that you, I've zoomed in on here. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's just not a reliable installation. So that's something that we would immediately want to recommend to a customer, talk to a customer about of, you know, having a standard installation drawing for these so somebody doesn't go out and put hoses where they're not supposed to. So looking specifically at uh, products that we've developed, very common in almost all the uh, flush plans are those orifices. You know, the 11, 12s, 13s, and 14s all contain orifices. How do we do that in a tubing environment? So we go from a orifice plate in a flange to a tube fitting. So now you can get orifices inside tube fittings. The minimum recommended orifice um, inside uh, uh, these systems from API is eight inch, and that is the most common size that we see. Uh, you can note here that what we've done is tag that fitting to make sure that it's identifiable as an orifice fitting. We certainly don't want anybody grabbing the wrong orifice size or a full flow fitting when they're looking to put an orifice size. So we tag that for safety and we note the size of the orifice on there, um, but they can be made to whatever uh, orifice size you need. There you can see the plate inside and that would be specified at time of ordering. 
There are uh, between bearing pumps out there, and this fitting was developed to work on the flush system for between bearing pumps. So it's got an integral orifice up top. You can see that 0.125 or eighth inch uh, denotation on the fitting as well as in flow direction. But there is a little port on top drilled in there, a quarter inch female MPT, so that you can put a valve and a gauge in there. And you can see from the picture on the right, they're monitoring here that pressure drop across that orifice in that fitting as it flows to each end and each seal in a between bearing pump. You can also put an orifice in a flange adapter. So these flange adapters go from 150 or 300 pound flange or whatever flange size or type you need to a swage lock tube fitting. So it's easy to adapt from piping to tubing we could put an orifice in this fitting as well. And you can see again, any time that we're putting an orifice in that fitting, we're going to denote it with a tag and let everybody know that it is a restricted type of fitting. So your plan 11, the most common plan that we see out there, looks just like this. You have your orifice in the flange adapter. Then we've installed a little block and bleed system for a gauge so you can monitor that orifice a clean, nice sweep of tubing, no hard 90s in there, down into our extended male connector. Um, so we've efficiently added a way for them to monitor that orifice, improve the flow rate, and reduced uh, potential leak points, and e even something as simple as a plan 11. You know, plan 21 is just like a plan 11, except for we're putting a cooler on the system. And we find these all over plants, uh, especially in the refining world. You know, chillers, the most common issue that everybody complains is, well, my cooling water isn't so good. So these kind of, these get clogged sometimes um, and their efficiency is reduced or they stop working completely. Um, so, you know, when I'm looking at this system, the only method I have to look if my orifice gets clogged or if my heat exchanger fouls is I'm looking for that temperature indicator. So I am uh, going to show you now some pictures from the field of some of the, the ways we've seen customers add temperature indicators into these systems. So on the left here is, is from a, a skid builder for seal support systems in, in India. Um, they are standardized in pipe over there and welded pipe. Um, but look at this, you know, the size of that installation just to add something simple as a thermometer. I mean, lots of time on welding. Um, they're sizing up from about a half inch pipe to four inch pipe to get that thermal well stem down in there and that thermometer stem into the flow. Um, so it requires additional support, et cetera. Um, just a, a very bulky, difficult way to install temperature indication. In the picture on the right, Another, you know, um, fabricated assembly where I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five welds um, on that. So that, you know, that could have taken somebody, you know, an hour and a half or so to, to weld something like that up. And then they've threaded the thermal well and the thermometer into that system. You have a potential safety issue when doing this, when they aren't um, locked down systems, where an installer, if that thermometer goes bad might, and want to replace that, it's potential that they could put their wrench on that thermal well and accidentally disassemble that um, thermal well. So then you have a free release of whatever is running in your flush system, which is typically a hydrocarbon, um, out into the environment. So not a, not a complete safe installation and improvements can be made using our thermal well T. So the thermal well T uses standard swage lock T fittings, half inch, three quarter, one inch, right? So you have half inch tubing running through um, horizontally. And then we take a short stem thermometer and put it in a short stem thermal well, but we weld that thermal well into the fitting. We do a seal weld around there so that it cannot be accidentally disassembled. You have the thermal well sticking into the flow of the fluid to get good temperature reading, but it's not an obstruction. You certainly don't want an obstruction in any of these flush systems that reduce the flow where you're not planning on it, like at an orifice. So this way, if the thermometer ever goes bad, installer goes up, they can just uninstall that thermometer, put a new one in, never break into the system, never shut down. There's no potential that they're gonna unthread that thermal well by accident.
Plan 32, if you look at API or in any of the seal manufacturers books, I think I took this picture from a FlowServe book. Um, this is what it looks like where they're calling out components typically oriented on a, a piece of drawn pipework like this. So, uh, you know, API says, as long as you have these components in the sequence on your system, you comply with our, our requirements. But this is an actual 32 that I've encountered in the field. And this is the reality of what happens when there isn't standard designs and somebody looks something up in a book and says, all right, I gotta have a flow meter, a check valve and a strainer, et cetera, in this order and they go and they kind of put something together. And while this might be, you know, a, a quick fix for something, you know, oftentimes these get installed and then kind of forgotten about until they have a problem. Here, I'm looking at my flow coming in from the top of the screen through this hose. It's got to do a complete U-turn and go up through my headland flow indicator through a rusty strainer, make a hard bend 90, another rusty check valve, and then for my flow control on this, somebody's got a half turn ball valve. So this might be the most egregious example of a Plan 32 I've ever seen because in terms of reliability and safety, a half turn ball valve to regulate flow for a 32 is about the worst thing you could possibly do. In a shutdown, as you know, new people come on site, contractors come on site, if somebody has to work on this system, there's nothing there telling them what this system does, how it should perform, whether that ball valve should be open or fully closed because it's just not common practice to throttle a ball valve for um, flow control. Well, maybe it's more common than we'd like and it's certainly not recommended. So I think we can do better in that and even though in API it's shown as components on pipework or tubing, if you put a plan 32 on a panel and use high quality components, you gain a couple of advantages. First of all, now everything, all the instrumentation is placed at eye level and easily readable for uh, my uh, operator or my mechanic. If in that previous example, somebody had to go check the flow rate on that headland filter or a headland uh, flow meter, they have to get down on the ground and look at it. Um, but here you can see we're using a high, high quality flow meter. Um, we're using a couple extra uh, pressure gauges around the strainer to see when that clogs or if that clogs. Um, I've got my thermal well T in there with a nice thermometer and I'm using a needle valve for flow control. So even something simple as just putting on a panel increases reliability. And this is what it looks like installed. So we started with the standard design that I showed in the previous slide, but the customer said, hey, you know, instead of two separate gauges, I want a DP gauge with a bleed valve on there. I would like a bypass around the strainer. So if I need to operate a bypass, I can do that. Um, but otherwise, the function of this system is exactly the same as the function of our standard 32. Uh, the customer just wanted this orientation and this type of layout. And those types of changes for us are, are super easy. You can also note here that we've put indications on, you know, what the product is, what its function is, and in some instance here, you know, what actual part number is there in case they need to order a spare. So we're practicing all of the best, best practices as laid out in API um, and incorporating that into a panel for, you know, there's a, a portion of the, the standard that does call out that instrumentation um, around these systems should be easily readable and in a centralized location. So we're accomplishing that through this panel. I'll speak to one of the safety improvement projects that we worked on at a refinery in California. Um, this was seal pots uh, for pumps with Plan 52. When they had to fill the seal pots, their refill procedure was very cumbersome. Uh, they were looking to upgrade the systems from an older design to comply with API 4th edition, which says you should no longer use a ladder to fill up seal pots. Because what they had to do before was shut down uh, the equipment, cool it off, take a ladder, uh, put it next to the pot, climb up to the top, take off a pipe plug, possibility of exposure to hot or hazardous vapors in there. So it wasn't a safe or effective um, in a time-based way, uh, a method for filling the seal pots. So we just didn't, you know, didn't have to change out the seal pots on this project, but install a safe fill assembly. So this assembly that you see on the left was the one that was implemented at that plant where we teed into the top of the pot. We have a check valve up there so flow only goes up th through the fill assembly into the pot. 
And then we have a series of valves and gauges at the bottom to check that line to see if it had residual pressure. Let's say my check valve failed in there. I would note that on that gauge on the bottom and I know, okay, I got to deal with this a different way. If everything was copacetic and there is no pressure in that line, I could hook up my fill cart and pump up the fluid up into the top off my pot without ever having to take the equipment down uh, or offline or climb up on a ladder. So again, complying with the fourth edition, adding a simple uh, fill assembly like this to existing seal pots help them comply. And then as this project kind of pushed throughout the plant over a year or so, and all seal pots got retrofitted with this design, they they increased their reliability because now they didn't have to have different ways to fill seal pots. They, they could train everybody on this is the one, one way. So it helped increase reliability and safety. On the right here, you can see that safe fill assembly incorporated into our standard designs on all pots now. So each seal pot had a fill tube. All we had to do, because you know the pots are different heights throughout the plant, was just take a couple of measurements, increase that length or decrease that length of the tubing, uh, so that the installer had to just go up, put that T in there, and insert this assembly, and that way they could retrofit each uh, seal pot. So now the operator works from ground level. They can see their gauges in there to check pressure in the line. Nobody's exposed to vapors and that single method to fill all seal pots on the site. So it's not something when we talk about standardization, especially in a, you know, a brownfield site, an existing site, um, it, it, it's something we always talk about, but it does take time to implement. And by working with the local Swage Lock Sales and Service Center, you know, they can help implement that over time. So as areas of the plant and projects happen, these things can be incorporated. That led us into building seal pots, or excuse me, seal fill carts. Um, so on the left there, we have a little pump car, are very common, just the two wheel roll around variety with the little hand pump on top. On the right is a much bigger version for a very large site, um, but typically, you know, we see 10 to 12 of these on a site, depending on how large the site is uh, for various fluids for different seal pot service. So these can be customized um, any way for the customer, uh, made to different sizes or just standard versions if you like the small ones. So one other thing I'd, talk, I'd like to talk about on a, a standardization project or looking at systems is examining existing documents documentation if you do have it uh, in your company. So this drawing or uh, picture I have right here is from a, a refinery on the West Coast and it was a 53B and this was their standard design. So for years, if they needed a new 53B system, send this drawing out to their seal company or fabricator to make it up for them and they would just make it per the drawing. Well, when we zoom in up top, we see that these systems have been changed over the years. Uh, there's a combination of tube fittings on there, some threaded fittings, welded valves. So, you know, the owner operator of this site was looking at this saying, gosh, it, you know, if we need to make any changes to this system once it's installed, I, I don't know always know what distance in the field. It's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff. So somebody at one point did look at this system and make changes from probably an all welded system, but did it so it was piecemeal. They just replaced you know, the, the, the supply and return lines with tubing uh, and never rethought the whole system. So they asked us to start with a plan 52 and design it using all tubing and create a new standard installation. And so this is a capability that all sales and service centers have with their engineering staff is to work with uh, an end user on coming up with a new standard design and generating a drawing uh, for them so that now they have a new standard 52 on site. I'll show you then the 53B since that was the original project. So this is what a 53B would look like um, as the correct way to design and then on the left install it. So I want to bring up a important feature of these systems, especially for maintenance and repair operations. If you order the 53B on the right, you'll get the stand, the accumulator, the chiller, all the right components that gets delivered to the site. Don't forget about that needs to then be installed. 
not everybody is an expert with SEAL systems and how they should be installed. Um, so what we do is come up with an installation kit to accompany the full assembly on the right. And that is, again, an engineer drawing uh, that gives people a kit of components so they have all the right fittings, valving, thermometers, valves, whatever they need uh, to hook up that plan 53B. So one of the, the issues in a 53B is air bleed. You need to have those air bleed valves in there. If you get a slug of air in your chiller or in your seal chamber, you can dry run the seal or lose your cooling efficiency. And we found that if there wasn't, you know, good instructions going to the site on how to install something like this, guys would often forget to put in important features like high point vents or bleed valves on the bottom. So little considerations like that and planning through projects help increase reliability so that even a workforce that may not be expert with SEAL support systems um, has an engineer drawing and has the ability to actually build the system, hook it up properly. I've seen you know, the inlet and outlet reversed on seal pumps. Uh, the supply and return lines are opposite of what they should be. Uh, just because guys don't know, they're, they're contractors, they haven't worked around this stuff. So how can we help you guys increase reliability by providing simple things like drawings for connection kits and the right components? All right, the last thing I wanna say is here on the 54, I'm showing you a picture of a, a skid system. This one isn't, you know, I'm not showing it because it's dirty. Um, that's a refinery, that's just what systems get to look like over time. I'm really focusing on the, the upper works of the system where it's incredibly difficult for mechanics to go in and work on these systems because of mishmash of tubing on there. Um, at least on this one, they have some flow indication direction but we did a redesign of the system and did a nice clean installation so that now this system is easy to maintain. You can see on the left, we have a block and bypass system for two sets of filters. So now they can change filters and keep the system running. The pump is located right on the top with an easy way to access that pump if it ever needs to be serviced. All the tubing is cleanly laid out on top so you can see where everything's going. And of course, I've got my instrumentation all centrally located and easily visible. I've got you know three temperature or three pressure gauges and a temperature gauge. So a lot of the work that we do with end users is talking through not just the design of the system, but then also planning is what do you need to maintain on the system? And how do we design something that makes it easy for you to maintain? You're gonna own this asset for 10, 20 years. How do we make that as simple and easy as possible to maintain? Some other panel pictures. This one is not a, a bad example of some labeling. It's a 7276. On the left, I have my 72 which is my clean dry nitrogen going into the seal. And then on the 76, I have two collection systems for the, um, the leakage collection portion of that 76. So you can see they have some tags and things on their flow directions, but I think there can be even improvements on this. Here's a picture of the 7276 we delivered to a refinery in Kansas where uh, it was on an ISO stripper. So they could possibly have on that uh, collection side, the 76 side, some acids in the line. So what we did on the panel, we've wrapped that panel uh, with a vinyl wrap, similar to what a car wrap uh, decal situation looks like. And you can see there's a, a denotation of a material difference. You've got the 76 in orange, which is out of Monel. The 72 is in 316 stainless steel, and that is denoted by the white background. So now a operator walking up to this knows two things right away. I have two different systems, and I've got two different materials. So that helps them from you know, missing uh, putting you know, stainless steel where Monel should be. Also, you can see the massive amounts of information that can be printed on the back of these panels. Um, your gauge on the upper left there says nitrogen pressure to the seal two to three PSI. I'm mirroring that at the regulator where it says regulator set at two to three PSI. So we're, we're doing a lot here to make these panels more operable 
especially for somebody who may not be super familiar with the system. They walk up to it. It's easy for them to see exactly how it should be operated, what the components are, and what the right set points are. So just to look at the, the catalog or application guide, that would be our standard literature for this. I wanted to point out a few things. Um, in, in that ISO diagram at the bottom of the page there, everything in black, all those lines in black are the components that are, are minimum requirements of API 682 fourth edition. We've added in some additional options there. Here you can see a bypass, uh, some isolation valves, differential pressure gauge setup. Those are all options that you may want uh, as an end user if you had a bad actor pump or a situation where you wanted certain abilities, extra instrumentation. So those are called out in the catalog as just options. So in working with our customers, we thought one of the challenges that they had was how do we come up with a, a design very simply and quickly? So we developed in that catalog a way for us uh, at, the, at the distributorship and sales and service centers to, through drop-down menus, choose various componentry sizes and types to create a part number for either a, a Plan 11 kit or an entire seal pot system. This Excel-based system then feeds into AutoCAD to generate a drawing in real time. So just by choosing the different options on uh, our Excel screen, we can then have AutoCAD in the background through design tables come up with a drawing super quickly in real time. Our goal with this is to really get you about 80 to 90% of the way towards a final design super fast so you can get a budgetary price, et cetera, and work out maybe some final details in the end. So we really invested a, a lot of time in the background um, software to support this program. So globally, our sales and service centers can support you locally getting quick designs and quick pricing on these systems. Okay, so that's the what I have for us today on our program for SEAL support systems. Um, do we have any questions? Hi, it looks like we had um, just a few questions. We had some people pointing out those host issues on the example that you saw earlier. Um, if anyone had any questions more specifically to SEAL support systems, go ahead and type those out now. Um, we also had a question on if there will be a recording of this presentation available, and the answer is yes. So I will send um, the recording out via email to everyone, and it will also be available on our website, which is alfl.swagelock.com. Um, so that is where that will be, and it looks like we at this time, don't have any further questions, but great job, Sean. Thank you so much for leading this session. Not a problem at all, and thanks everybody for for listening. If if you do have questions later on, you know, feel free to contact Ashton, and you know, we can we can speak directly or set up any kind of follow up call um, that would be needed to discuss a specific application. Awesome. Well, thank oh, you all so much. I think Micah has a question right there. Michael, I can't see. Oh, here we go. So he wants to verify that the application guide will be sent out with, with each 53B assembly. Yes, sure. So we can provide you um, right now with that application guide so you have that complete catalog available. And, and then what we would do uh, should you purchase a 53B from us, you know, we would uh, create that design, whether it's the standard or unique to whatever options you want on your um, 53B. And then that would become, uh, there would be a, a a, like a user's manual generated with that so that you would understand all the replacement components, the design principles, et cetera. So I, I look at it as two separate things. The application guide is really our, our, our catalog with the options in it. Um, what would be created upon order is a final design drawing and all the documentation that would go with it uh, on operating the system. Looks like we have another question from Jason. Could you not use an elbow on that hose if your customer doesn't want to use tubing? 
Uh, good question, Jason. Um, I think that my recommendation and, and certainly API's recommendation in any VOC service is to not use hoses because of the unreliable nature of hoses in general. Um, if if it's a ANSI installation or something, or the end user absolutely needs or wants to use a hose, um, I would recommend consulting our hose catalog for the proper installation method for hoses to reduce all the strains on those points. Like that picture where you saw that kinking happening, yes, you could use an elbow and, and um, orient that differently to reduce some of those stresses. Um, I, I found that almost, um, universally uh, that nobody's using hoses in you know a, a real API application for this because uh, there's it's difficult also for them to find a way to support the hose in the field next to this equipment there isn't a lot of ways to hang that hose properly so you get the right flow rates etc so I mean clearly if it's a petrochem plant or a refinery go with the tubing um, if you're concerned about flow I would go with 245s instead of a 90 is is what I see often in the in the field um, so th those are a couple ways that you can work around using a hose if you have to use a hose make sure it's, it's the right rating and then um, work with our sales and service center on the proper orientation to reduce stress Awesome. Well, thank you again, Sean. It looks like that is all the questions that we had. Once again, a reminder, we will have another um, session on um, grab sample systems in two weeks. So be on the lookout for that information on our website and coming to you via email. And with that, we will go ahead and wrap up for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, healthy.